Hey, Michael, this is uh, Dean Kate from Sick and Wrong. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Great to see you guys. Hey, yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Um, so I, I recently read about uh, your collective and uh, was intrigued. You know, I wanted to learn more. And so, so I wrote to you, and I, it was cool connecting to you with you the other day. So tell me about Four Thieves Vinegar Collective. What, what's the purpose? What's the mission? The mission is to try to get medicines and medical technologies to people who need them but don't have access for whatever reason. And we're pretty agnostic about our methodologies in this regard. So across the globe, or you focus on like specific countries that deny people medication or, or block medication for people? Well, in, you know, civilized countries like Iceland, where it's not a problem and everybody can get everything they need, um, we don't have a lot of activity. Actually, I should correct that. In Iceland, there's actually, uh, it's difficult to get Narcan, and we have been working with some members of parliament there to try and ease that. But in, in general, they have pretty good health care in most of Scandinavia. And so, yeah, places like uh, that or other places where healthcare is socialized to a fair degree, um, you know, it, Canada does a decent job of it. The UK at least used to do a decent yeah. job of it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, it used to. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, despite the fact that we are ideologically an anarchist collective, in environments where the infrastructure is sufficiently sophisticated that it's taking care of its constituency rather than leaving it in the lurch, there's no need for us. And and that's kind of great, actually. Yeah, I was about to say, that's a as good a, thing. As a goal, we'd like to be irrelevant eventually. Um, well, unfortunately, with uh, certain legislations that, that's about to be overturned, uh, I think we need you more now than, than ever. So you run yeah. the collective. Yeah. Uh, when when did you found it? Like when did it start? Well, um, it's it's hard to say. I started thinking about these sorts of questions and trying to develop strategies to attack them, starting really in two thousand eight. But it wasn't until more like twenty fifteen that. Um, I started working on this with sort of all of my energy and time and concentration. How many people are in the uh, collective? Like, how many people do you work with? Um, wow, it would be hard to count. Currently, um, probably around... 60 i'd say oh wow yeah much larger than i yeah. thought it's 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 more than that probably and it's also it's it's hard to quantify because mm. it's pretty loosely organized and people do come and go with a fair degree of frequency um do all the members have like science or medical or engineering backgrounds oh no i mean and and also it depends on how you define background there are plenty of people who are self-taught who are really sophisticated we do have plenty of people who do have formal training, people who are MDs and RNs and, you know, pharmacists, um, people who are trained uh, formally as scientists. Um, but we work with people across the board. Um, there are people who have no formal training and are still very good at that. We also work a lot with people who are non-scientists um, for a lot of the things that we do, we collaborate with artists and uh, uh, various creative types mm. who work to help us communicate what we're doing. Um, recently, we've been working with an animator, which is really exciting. Um, so th it's a it's a really diverse group. It sounds um, like it's really fun to be able to. You know, my day is spent interacting with all kinds of different people from, you know, graphic design artists to user interface design people and chemists and surgeons and, um, and you know, political strategists. It's, it's and moral philosophers and, and on down the line. It's, um, it's, it's really good. It's really good time.
What is your background? Are you a, a, a trained yeah. scientist or? Um, I am uh, not in this field. My background's in mathematics and physics. I, I did my undergraduate work in mathematics and physics. I was, a, I was a double major. And then I entered graduate school in the math department um, and did my PhD in math. But ultimately, my advisor was a physicist. And the problem that I worked on for my doctoral dissertation was a question from high energy physics, particle physics. So I, that, that's my background in particle <laughs> physics and, and uh, abstract mathematics. Um, yeah, uh, so I don't, um, I was never a lab scientist really. Um, and I'm, I'm not formally trained beyond sort of a basic level in uh, biology or chemistry. I, I did enough of that that I can have an intelligent conversation with somebody who is trained in that background. But, um, but you, you, you never worked in like a laboratory doing this. Yeah, no, not, you know, not beyond college. Um, like I, I did lab work in college, but it's very basic. So I, I sort of know how all these things happen. So when I have conversations with these really sophisticated chemists that are part of the collective, I know enough that when they explain something to me, I can you understand can it, but I would never be able to come up with the things that they come up with. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't even think I could follow them, but <laughs> I'd try. I just need a little more of a background. So how, what, what, made, what made you get into biohacking? At the time, like, were you familiar with the term? No, like, no. It was, it was uh, very circuitous that I discovered the biohacking community at all. I mean, I come from a hacking background, certainly. I was a, I did, I was a computer hacker when I was a kid. You know, it was this <laughs> wonderful new promising world that you could explore yeah. and it was very it felt so good it was extremely egalitarian um people were very much judged based on their ability and it was it was you could learn so much and you could deconstruct and build systems and it was so exciting so that and, and the hacker ethic always resonated with me these sorts of ideas that technology can be used to creatively to make things that make the world better and that information should be accessible and free and shared and that knowledge and information belongs to humanity not to individuals or small groups and that we're we're, we're all in it together and let's learn and let's make great things and so that that was a that was a world that always resonated with me and that I remain peripherally part of uh, since I was a kid. And so when I started building stuff that was the genesis of the things we now um, develop at Four Thieves, I didn't know where else to go to present what I had. So I contacted Hackers on Planet Earth, which is the conference that the magazine 2600 the hacker quarterly puts on and they said yeah we'd love to have you and that that was sort of my first entree into the public world and very quickly the collective became more than just me um because there were all of these people who were better at all the things that i was <laughs> trying to do so so desperately but, but that was your intro um, to the community though yeah um so you had mentioned to me the other night that there's like two different types of biohackers so there's the ones that yes. that kind of aspire to be like a cyborg like they're like modifying themselves their their bodies technically and then there's like mm. it sounds like four thieves like altruists who are using technology to make the world better well i I, I wouldn't separate it that way. I think that um, when you look at the real biohackers, that both groups have an altruistic bent. They have different strategies, though. The two, the two strategies are the sort of cyborg thing where what you're doing is you're taking 
uh, existing technology and trying to integrate it with living organisms. Um, so, mm. as you mentioned, like building implants, um, and you know, and I do some of that as well. Um, trying to find ways to integrate the human body and animal bodies to some degree into uh, integrated systems of of modern technology. And there's a lot of cool things that are being done with that. And some of those quite altruistic. And then there's the other, the other strategy centers around um, looking at biological systems as the platform for the hacking, the manipulation where people will manipulate genes or look at gene expression or uh, adjust chemical or chemical signaling systems. I mean, you know, really, if you want to think about the first, first transhumanists and the first biohackers, you talking about trans people, right? They yeah. were the first mm-hmm. ones to say, Hey, I'm adjusting my biology and I don't Changing care if anybody gender. likes it or gives me permission. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, they're like shifting their biological structure. So it's, yeah. it's, it's kind and of so, fun. yeah, I think there are some people who have tried to co-opt the term biohacking to just say like, oh, I make my coffee differently or I take my amphetamines in a certain stack or whatever, and I call myself a biohacker. But the, the people that I would label as biohackers all have this inherently altruistic bent of saying, how do we improve the quality of life for people using technology. I mean, Left Anonym, who coined the term biohacking, defines it that way. And and I ascribe to that definition very much. So do you have chips implanted in your body? I do, oh, yeah. You, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what what do they do? I'm intrigued. The, the first implant I got um, was a pirate file server that I built myself. Um, we would, so, so there's a very small event um, that's held out in the Mojave desert with a, a very, very wonderful, wonderful group of hardcore biohackers um, who call themselves grinders because of their sort of avant-garde approach really to things. Like and Left Anonym was there and asked me to make an implant uh, on the spot. This was just like an idea that Left had. And we spent the next 50 hours building this implant and and then coded it and then it got surgically implanted. And it was something like 10 months that this thing that we just, just sprinted together, to put together yeah. worked and it was so cool. And it was, it was exactly that. It was a wireless uh, pirate file server that, um, that lived in left's uh, upper arm uh, for a long time. And so then we spent uh, the, the group of guys that I worked with to build that and i tried to figure out a way to make it smaller and more functional which we did and it took us i don't know 10 months of a tremendous amount of work Um, but we did and we presented that at at uh, defcon um Hmm. so what happened was you know i was coordinating across three continents and like endless late night early morning phone calls trying to get all the hardware and software working. And once we finally did, then I built the hardware and loaded it with the software that the software guy had written. And then I shipped it to California where the guy who does the biocompatible coatings coded it. And then I flew there and arrived shortly before DEF CON and um, yeah, and then he did the surgery. So and what, what is the surgery? Put in my like, leg. How how involved is the surgery? They just kind of cut open a slice in your leg, slip it in, or are there are certain spots that are more amenable. Yeah, I mean it's basically that the the way that um, it, you have a subcutaneous sort of 
layer, very thin layer of fat that sits between your skin and your muscle. Mm -hmm. And basically you sort of open that up to make space. Um, and yeah, slip the thing in. Slip the thing in. And so what does it do? What does it allow you to do? So when you spin it up, it creates a wireless hotspot. So if you were on your phone or your computer, you just see a network there that said peg leg. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and when you log into it, uh, it's it's a web page. It's a web page interface. And there's a there's a chat. There's a chat box. So you can you can have real time chats with anybody else who's connected to the network. And there's a, there are forums, so you can post things. And then there's a file repository where you can upload and download and stream. And the thing that's special about it is that everything's scrubbed and anonymized. Um, and it's only a local area network. It's not connected to the internet, right? So this is something where people can communicate in a small space without fear of surveillance from afar, yeah. uh, without right. any any trail of documentation of what they might or might not have done. Like if somebody uploads something like, well, who did that? Well, I don't know. Oh, is that protected under copyright? Well, nobody's business. You know, I mean, it's all you know. Um, and so it's impossible to censor. It's impossible to surveil. Uh, everything's anonymous. And the other thing that's so cool about this is that it is a mesh network node so the other people who also have these, these communicate laterally. So you can file share between nodes. So if you're connected to my peg leg, um, but I'm in turn close enough to somebody else's peg leg that has a file that you want, you can request it from mine and mine will act as a relay. It's like airdrop. Um, do you, how do you know if someone else is I guess has one of these uh, wireless implants. Like, does it just pop up on your computer? Like, oh, nearby, there's like six people that have it. Um. Well, you can, if you spin it up, yeah, it'll show up as an as an open Wi-Fi network, essentially. Oh, wow. Um. So yeah, e easy to find. You can just sense it. This is it. like a modern Hellfire Club. This is how the future is going to be. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. that's sort of the idea, and and the the inspiration for it was again harkening back to the early days of the internet. Rotten it had rotten. such promise. I miss it every day. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that was my favorite. If you could make a chip where I could just load up the original rotten.com, I would get that implanted in myself in like a second. Get the internet archive. So <laughs> yeah, so this was so this was the this was sort of the genesis where it was like I remember and I think a lot of people like you remember that there was this promise where it was more than what we hoped. We genuinely believed that the internet was going to be this new place that was impossible to commodify yeah. and it was impossible to surveil and it was impossible to censor and it was going to be this free egalitarian place where we could you know sort of rebuild things in a new way that was sort of fueled by hope and so as naive. it's turned out it's been the opposite of all <laughs> so of those well things yeah. right so, naive. so yeah. heartbreaking it's so heartbreaking and um, and so I, I had this conversation that you and I are having so many times with so many people who are technologists and, you know, incredibly sophisticated people. And the conclusion that everybody has come to is, well, we need a new internet. Uh, okay, cool. But that's easy to say. Wow. <laughs> um, and the question of how that gets implemented is really, really touchy. Um, there have been a number of attempts to do it, but all of the current attempts, they're fairly difficult to manage and they all sit on top of the existing backbone structure of the internet. Um, like and, the dark web, basically. Kind of. It sounds like right. So, so like Tor, plan. like yes. Tor is one example or Freenet. Yeah. or um, IPFS, other protocols that, that are ch they're changing the protocol structure, um, but on a higher level, right? On a higher layer than 
saying, look, um, I know nobody likes to talk about this, but everything that we do and say goes through a light pipe that's controlled by a nation state's government. Yeah. And Big man. nobody seems to like be bothered by this or think about that as a security risk. I mean, some people do, you know, security experts do, but this is not part of the sort of common discourse. Um, so, so I made any number of attempts to try and adjust that and try and get back what we thought we were going to get. Um, I, at one point, tried to actually um, <laughs> get the Iridium network to give me their old satellites before they decommissioned them. <laughs> and we had this great plan that we were going to just keep them up maintain them and just have a free data network um that was just open and eventually i mean and we got actually into negotiations and i chatted with the ceo he was a nice guy and he turned me down eventually and for for good well thought out reasons he didn't just tell me to to buzz off um but that didn't work and so then you know the the next question the next question then when we made these these implants i thought Gosh, you know, if enough of us had these, maybe this this That's could the be network. our new internet. Yeah, um, it hasn't happened yet. I think only, um, I don't know, maybe only eleven people have them, but they're they're out there. You never know. You yeah. might be near one once. If you see if you see a if you see a Wi-Fi network pop up when you're in a cafe somewhere that says peg leg, like. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> Look around. There's somebody you're going to be able to have a really good conversation with, probably. I, I think it's the surgical implantation that probably discourages u- user adoption, but who knows? Um, they might catch on. Oh, for sure. For sure. Like, you say yes. that, but a lot of women have the contraceptive implant, and it's the same yeah. type of deal. I mean, like, it's the same thing. That's a good point. That's yeah. a good That's point. point. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Michael, you are recently in the media again. Um with your tutorial on how to make abortion pills at home. Obviously, I think, you know, obviously due to the recent news about uh, Roe versus Wade being possibly overturned, um, something like uh, being able to make abortion pills at home could really help people. So you put out a tutorial on how to do this. How difficult is it? Like, how, how would you even source the drugs? Like, what is it, misoprostol and mifepristone? Like, how do you get those? Yeah, I, it's it's surprisingly easy in terms of the various things that we have um, tried to create tutorials of various types for. This is probably the easiest. Oh. Um, so I think we did this first in 2018 at um, Please Try This at Home 2, which is a... a bodily autonomy, biohacking, anarchist uh, sort of, yeah, uh, a conference imagine. that happened in Pittsburgh. And we did a workshop. We actually had everything there and people sat down and made their own sets of abortion drugs. Um, and it was really cool. Like, uh, and I was really excited by it. I thought it was really promising to have this, information out there and somebody had actually recorded audio from that entire session which was really nice and and archived it and somebody had written up um sort of an instruction set which i thought was so great but it really didn't get any traction like i thought this was really important but aside from a small group of people who are activists this went largely unnoticed and then i don't know uh uh some months ago, Texas did yeah. another one of their shenanigans Fear of trying to restrict access to abortion at the state level. And so I flew into a bit of a panic and um, decided that it was necessary to put together a video tutorial because video is the format that most people consume their information on these days and yeah, so i thought no okay well meet people where they're at this is if this is the medium i'll put something out in that medium and i thought it was very topical and uh again i got almost no traction 
which I thought was very strange. You know, again, a handful of activists were said some very kind things, and I don't think it got. Yeah, that's uh, weird. You'd think that would go viral. Was... Say again. You'd think something like that would go viral, like get picked up by news organizations, things like that, and. Yeah. yeah, well, I did. I did. But I I misestimate where our projects land every time. So, again, that one didn't get much traction. Um, and it sat online for months and months. And then when it hit the front page of the New York Times, <laughs> what the, what the uh, Supreme Court was getting up to, I mean, and again, it's 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 strange to sort of look at how information moves because that, first of all, anybody who was watching knew that that was coming oh, like yeah. a half a dozen years ago. Right. Oh, yeah. And, um, and indeed, furthermore, that leak came months ago, as I understand it. Hmm. But once it hit the papers, then everybody lost their minds. Freaking out. Um, and so then, yes, then all of a sudden that, that got, you got your traction because it became more of the moment. Yeah. And so how difficult is it to, you're saying it's, it's, it's relatively easy, I guess, to make this abortion pill. It's just two different drugs that you kind of combine, but do you, I mean, no, you, no, you don't combine them. So, so oh. the, the regimen um, is that you take <laughs> one of the drugs, you take one dose of one of the drugs and you wait a set period of time and then you take a dose of the other one, and then you wait a set period of time, and then you take a second dose of the other one, and wait a set period of time, and then you take a third dose of the second one, okay. and, and that's it. And that's just, that's it. You, you swallow, um, you know, four sets of pills. And so you just need to make those pills. And I should amend the word swallow. You, you swallow the first one, and then the the second three sets you let dissolve uh, between your cheek and your teeth. Um, oh. So, hmm. it, and and this is the thing in a lot of cases, right? If you want to make your own drugs, all you have to do is figure out what the active pharmaceutical ingredient is, order that active pharmaceutical ingredient from a chemical supplier, and put it in a gel cap. So, okay. for mifepristone, which is the first drug, you can literally do that. You you get the API, you measure it out on a scale, you put it in some gel caps, and then you have that. That's the first pill. Then for the, the second three, you need to press a tablet because it needs to dissolve. Um, and that, I mean, it takes a little bit of practice, but again, at our workshop, we had these pill presses. And again, that's not like a fancy thing. It's a, it's a $10 item off of Alibaba that consists of three pieces of steel. You put the powder in, you, you mist it with some water and you hit it with a hammer and then it becomes a tablet or a pollen press where it's sort of a tube with a screw in it and then you just press it down and then you push it out and let it dry. Um, hmm. And so that that takes a little practice because you're not just putting in your active pharmaceutical ingredient, you're also putting in buffer and binder, which again, are not fancy things. You're talking about um, like uh, powdered sugar and, and um, powdered milk, right? Just something to hold it together and something to take up some space so it's the right size. Um, you, you missed it with a spray bottle, you squeeze down the press, however you have it, and then you just let it dry on a paper towel, and then you're done. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's really not. not and then not if difficult. you're in America, you charge two hundred dollars for each. <laughs> a little right. more than yeah. that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. do do you have a warning on the like? Is this dangerous potentially? Like, make abortion pills at your own risk, or are there no, you know, major side effects? No, I mean, I've I've had some strange conversations with some people who have said like yeah how do we make um abortion pills safer and i was i i kind of you know furred my brow and i was like how can you possibly make them safer this is like <laughs> I mean, the best most functional medication that's ever been invented 
Um, they're like, well, these, these side effects of like cramping and bleeding. And I was like, those aren't side effects. You, that's, that's those are process. primary effects. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's, it's your body. That's part of what happens when you're yeah. in, inducing this change in your body. Um, so the, no, there, there's not, there's not really a warning that, that goes along with it, save for the fact that it's not a hundred percent effective, although it's roughly 95% effective if you use it properly, which is pretty good. Um, additionally, when you take those drugs orally, there's no way to detect that you took them. You can't get a blood test or anything to determine that those drugs are in your body. So if you're in an extremely repressive environment where you would potentially be prosecuted for doing something like that, there's no way to prove that you did. You can, if it goes wrong, you can merely show up at a hospital and say, I feel like I'm having a miscarriage. Something's amiss. Help. And, you know, you'll they can't trace it. get the help you need, but you yeah. won't, and you won't go to jail. So um, for, you know, I mean, taking any drug is like, you're changing your body's chemistry. So it's, you do it with the respect it deserves, but um, I, yeah, I don't think this carries anything beyond the standard warnings. You're doing the exact same thing that you would do if you were acquiring commercial versions of those pills. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. I can't emphasize how important this is right now because you know if Roe versus Wade is actually overturned, you know they're probably going to try to ban all abortion pills next. But the the fact of the matter is, they're not going to be able to control DIY abortions. It's you know women will still have abortions, well, that, and if it's yeah, illegal, it'll, it'll just be more dangerous. Exactly. In the Victorian eras, women will always get abortions no matter what, but it's important to do it safely. I don't know if you're yes. aware of this, but in the UK now, ever since the COVID, it used to be that you would go into, up until a certain point, obviously, you would go into the hospital to have your abortions. But now you have your abortions at home in the UK. They send you with the pills. Nice. And 28 oh, days good. later, you'll go and get a scan just to make sure that, you know, everything has like, eggs to do uterus but that's becoming the norm like to have an abortion at home and personally as someone who's had abortions i would rather have an abortion at home because at least i'm at home in my own environment i'm comfortable yeah. here i don't have to go to yeah. the hospital yeah. yeah yeah and i mean and the thing is that's the thing is like since humans have been having abortions since humans have been having sex like it's it's <laughs> it's as old as biology like there's and there have been innumerable methods we have really good technology for it that's very very well established i mean it's that's a 50 or 60 year old technology um uh, and it it works like it works better than just about any other medication for anything else out there it's it's really quite amazing um yeah. and and furthermore like it, it the just to circle back to the question that you had about like, okay, you know, is, is making it a risky thing. I would say it's actually safer than <laughs> buying them commercially because you buy a pill commercially, you're taking it on faith that that was <laughs> manufactured properly, that it was stored properly, that it was shipped properly, that when it got put in the bottle, the right pills got put in, you know, th there are a lot of things that you're taking on faith that you're not allowed to audit. You can't vault the, you know, pharmacy no desk idea. and go back and be like, hey, <laughs> what did, sh show me where these came from. What's the date? And show me the provenance and show me your paperwork. Like, you're not yeah. allowed to even ask that. But while you, when you make your own, you're watching it happen. You, you don't even, like, there's no, it's not like, oh, well, maybe the tablet press dispense the wrong amount you're like you're making these pills one at a time you know exactly how much active pharmaceutical ingredient went into each tablet and so i for one would feel safer using something that i made because i saw it get made from start to finish as opposed to being like well let's see if these shiny things work you know <laughs> yeah like let's just trust this pharmaceutical company in india that's making my you know, whatever drug that I'm ordering over the internet versus making it yourself. You know, you yeah. Have and that. I mean, probabilistically though, if you're getting your stuff from India, it's more likely to have 
like good quality control than stuff from American yeah, companies. Probably. <laughs> like I don't trust anything. Good to here. know. Um, so what <laughs> other drugs has your collective produced? I mean, I read that uh, you guys did your own version of uh, uh, Daraprim, which was, wasn't that the, what's that guy's name, that asshole? The farmer bro. The Martin farm- Shkreli. Shkreli. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We made a good show of that. I actually called Martin Shkreli's cell phone from stage um, at at Hackers on Planet Earth, which was really fun. Um, he didn't answer the phone when I called, um, but I left him a message. And the funny thing was, is he called me back a couple hours later. Whoa. And we actually chatted for, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. And it was, it was an interesting conversation. He's in prison now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I wrote him a letter and he didn't write back, <laughs> but it was that one conversation that we did have was, it was, it was, it was fascinating. Um, Do Big Pharma yeah. not see you as a threat? Because you're Say bound again? to be, do Big Pharma, kind of, like, especially in America, do they not kind of see you as a threat though? Because you are a threat to them, to the way they make money. Well, I, I don't know. They're not very communicative with me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think that they don't see us as a threat. Yes. F- yet. And I think that, like, ultimately, we're not really a direct threat to the way they make money because what we're offering is a way that people who don't have access to these drugs and can't afford them can get them anyway. These are people that are not part of their market share. These are people who are left behind. And so it doesn't change the economics of how they do business when I give access to people who would otherwise just go without. Um, It's not like I'm a competitor where I'm like selling something for cheaper what I'm doing is just trying to show people how they can make things themselves and create their own access and help each other. So, you know, for thieves as a collective, we, we work to fill this gap and, you know, I mean, ultimately if they started being ethical in their practice, I mean, uh, then, you know, we wouldn't be necessary or, yeah, or if goal. insurance companies were ethical in their practice or government regulators were ethical in their practice, if any one of these groups got their proverbial act together, <laughs> then we could, you know, just become a, uh, I don't know, a, a collective that had fun phone calls and just chatted about how each other's cats are doing. And we wouldn't have to do all of this, this work. Um, and that's, that's really the goal. Ideally, we'd like to push ourselves into a state where we're no longer necessary we'd like to get to a point where we can you know drive enough of the public consciousness to the point where people who are trying to change policy and push through legislation and regulation can do so to the point where it's no longer a necessary thing um i mean and or if that doesn't happen we can at least get the concept of diy medicine socially normalized to the point where when somebody says oh gosh i need xyz medication and it's a zillion dollars somebody says well have you thought of just trying to make it yourself the same way that currently you know somebody says hey there's this really rare part that isn't made anymore for my old vcr that i'd like to fix somebody says hey have you thought about 3d printing it you know, exactly. and that's that's not a weird yeah. conversation. And, you know, 10 years ago, that was a little niche, right? Or maybe 15 years ago now, it was a little niche. But um, it's... Uh, I think it just, it will be normalized eventually. But I mean, that's the fact of the matter is you're up against capitalism. You're up against the Martin Shkreli who will take a drug that was, what, $13 and make it $750. That, wow. That's why your collective is necessary. That's why it's needed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, so long as those things continue, I there will still be people fighting against it and we're Yeah. Good. We're all doing the best we can and it's uh we're going to keep at it. And it's brilliant. Like I read about uh you guys made your own EpiPen 
Like, I don't know how much those cost, but I'm sure you have to have insurance to get one. Um, Oh, that was, yeah, that was quite a thing. And again, that was, that was something where I had terribly misestimated the traction. I didn't think it was going to be noticed too much. And that got us a lot of attention, but it was very topical. Um, Heather Brash, uh, the president or CEO of Mylan was, you know, lying to Congress on live television and people were watching it happen. And it was a similar thing had happened where they had brought the price up to, uh, what was it $650 for a pair where it previously been like $150 um and you know that's very clear and present you go into anaphylactic shock you don't get one of those in a matter of minutes you are no longer alive you're gonna die is the end um and the weirdest part of it is that they just have a corner on the market that's it. It's the active ingredient in that is epinephrine. That costs a dollar a vial, no which way. if you, if a vial, I mean, if a vial is 10 milliliters, which is typical, that means that you would get over 30 doses out of that $1 vial. Um, and all you're doing is giving an intramuscular injection, which is not complicated. You literally stab somebody in the muscle and you dump the syringe. Now, I mean, you can do it correctly and you can do it in ways that are going to, you know, cause less of a contusion. But the only thing that's special about the EpiPen is that you just press it in and it does it for you. The amount is pre-measured and it's spring loaded. So you don't actually have to do it, but that's not really special. So we found an off the shelf auto injector that was designed for needle phobic diabetics And we showed how you could reload it with a syringe and needle combination that would deliver what you needed. And you just, you just load it. And you're talking about a $30 auto injector, um, you know, less than a dollar for the needle and the syringe and about a dollar for the epinephrine. And also that auto injector is reusable. You just reload it when you want to reuse it. So it costs $3 or something to reload instead of having to repurchase something that's, you know, entirely self-contained. And the last part that's just, that makes my bile duct rage is that these things are not, there's no way that you can manipulate them unless you break them open and you know how to do that. And so the thing was, is that was the, the narrative was just, just mind bending how bizarre it was. The, the price went up, there were these congressional hearings. And then right after that, there was a recall because like some 65 or 70,000 of them were faulty. And there were these heartbreaking stories over and over and over and over again of these failing and people dying. People right. having to watch yeah. their children die on airplanes because their EpiPen didn't work and after they'd already paid for it. And then after that, it got worse because they did a recall and supply wasn't meeting demand. They didn't have enough to go around. People were going without because even if they had the ability to pay for it, it wasn't there. And after all of that, the price still didn't change. Yeah, see, wow. that's insane. And the fact that, I mean, you're giving people their own knowledge and their own power to make the to make it, it's, you're saving lives. Um, so uh, real quick, I know we're going on a little bit long here. Uh, the other night when we were chatting, I asked if there are any like nefarious biohackers that you're aware of. Um, like, <laughs> and, and, and you know, I was reading about a guy named Josiah Zayner. I thought you were going to say Magneto. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I wouldn't go so far as to say there are nefarious biohackers who are, who are, you know, th- these aren't people that you would color as being bad actors in bad faith, but there are certain people who are trying to leverage biohacking to be a means for profit. Yeah. Um, and when, when people try to, uh, take a, a counterculture and turn it into a 
normalized subculture that then they profit off of by identity and branding. Like I, you know, being anti-capitalist, I don't think very highly of the capitalism apologists who come in and supplant a humanitarian effort into a business. Um, they argue vehemently uh, otherwise, but I, I don't, I don't buy their line. Well, who's this guy, this Josiah Zayner, that was actually selling CRISPR kits? Like, have you ever seen one of these kits? Is it, he injected, well, he injected yeah, himself with this CRISPR DNA. Yeah, no, I mean, and this was the thing. He and I, um, he and I used to do stuff together. He, uh, we, we, we were friends for a while, um, and he, he decided he didn't like me anymore, unfortunately, um, and it was it was sort of unfortunate um, because I thought that he was really being a good champion of the cause of biohacking for, for a while. And then we brought a lot of it was attention this very to it. Touchy event that happened in the biohacking community where uh, one of the high profile guys who was doing a bunch of things that seemed to me, very shady. And again, this was, this is where things sort of intersect where he had these visions of making a lot of money and he wound up dead under very, very suspicious circumstances and theories abound as to what happened, which I think is, you know, ridiculous because you can paint any story you want about how this guy died and it's no less tragic. Um, you know, was he on the verge of some great discovery and big pharma bumped him off or he would just, he was depressed because the system he was trying to build wasn't working and he went on a bender and that's how he died. It, it kind of doesn't matter. But what this did was it sent shockwaves through the biohacking community where people got very, very nervous and, and had a lot of scrutiny come to them and I think Josiah had just had a child at that time. And so I think he was also feeling a sense of paternal responsibility and thinking about how the messages that he was putting out there were being received. And I was really disappointed by what he put out because the whole underpinning of the concept of biohacking is something that's anti-authoritarian. The idea is you're saying this should be available to everybody and that's the goal. And again, Josiah felt that he was doing it in an ethical way by putting these kits together and then selling them at what he felt was a reasonable price. Um, and some of us were trying to say like, look, you don't have to buy a kit. You can assemble this yourself and maybe you don't need to go through uh, you know, a third party. But again, whatever it was, it was the, all of those efforts have the same goal. The goal is how do you make yeah. it so that an individual does not need an institution or an intermediary to be able to access the science that could potentially do good. And Josiah came out with this statement that he posted publicly everywhere that I, I found rather horrifying where what he did was he said, look, 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 look. I mess with my own DNA and I, you know, lied to certain purveyors to get viruses and things so that I could build this. And, but you shouldn't do this. This is okay because I have a PhD in biology and used to work for NASA. So I'm really smart and I know what I'm doing and you shouldn't. So everybody just calm down. And I thought that was really pretty gross. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it did the movement a, a great harm because it was then no longer about these questions of how do we empower people? How do we take this technology that is typically only for the most elite institutions and make that accessible to people who are experimenting in their garage, whatever method you try and do to do that. And it became this sort of 
like I, I don't know like I want to be a rock star yeah and, that's what I was like, about to say you know, it almost sounds like he was seeking fame or publicity. Like, I, I even read that he gave himself a fecal transplant in a hotel room, like with the journalist there. So he could, he right. could publicize like, this I'm, thing. You know, I'm sure he did a very no good variety. thing for his lower digestive system. I'm not sure <laughs> why you invited journalists to witness that. But, I mean, again, I don't know. I don't know. Um, like, what, what does that do for access for people he you know exactly um, nothing and, you know? And, i mean and some of the things that he's done I, I again I, I do think are good he did make um he worked with a couple of other biohackers in the very early days of covid to do a diy vaccine that he self-administered huh? which i thought was really cool um and and he they all made their data public and the story that i heard i'm not sure how accurate it is i didn't check any sources but the story that i heard was that there's a previous group that did not make their data public and asked him to participate and he, he said sure um let, let me, let's make the data public though and they said no no we're not going to do that and he said well then i don't want to be part of that and I think that that's pretty cool. Like that takes some grit when you've got a whole bunch of people who say, come and be part of what's potentially the most important project happening right now. Yeah. And mm -hmm. on, on an ethical basis, you say no. So, I mean, he, he has, so there's he has some elements compass, of altruism clearly. there. Um, yeah. It's different than mine. Um, and I don't think that he's, I don't think that he's acting in bad faith. I think that he and I have different worldviews of what's, uh, what makes the world better? He he has publicly spoken about what he believes the inherent good of capitalism capitalism is, and I uh, I publicly speak about how I <laughs> believe very much the contrary. Um, and so we're just we're dealing with the different antecedent uh, different axioms viewpoints. in our belief yeah. structure. Yeah, but I mean, uh, ultimately, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure some of the things he he does is uh, is for the betterment of society. So. He's drawing a I mean, lot of I think, attention. I think that that's what cause. he's trying to do. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think he's trying to. I think he's trying to make things better. I think he's doing it the way he thinks will work the best. Um, yeah, he, wow. he and I don't agree on that. So, uh, what, what's next for uh, Four Thieves? Like, what, what's the, what does the future hold for Four Thieves? So, the plague has made it hard to present things but we haven't wasted the time um we've spent the last two years building a lot of tools that were in the idea stage for a long time and i'm really 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 excited because i'm going to be speaking at hackers on planet earth um this year in new york mm -hmm. um in july and we're going to be presenting probably all but one of these projects so it's so it's and there are That's a lot cool. of them i think at, depending on how you count they're like you know, six or seven which is a pretty big deal usually i was pretty happy when we presented you know two or maybe three projects a year um uh, or, or even one in, in a lot of cases um so we have a lot to present we have a lot to present it's gonna be really exciting at hope um and hope's such a wonderful environment, usually filled with mostly really great people. Um, and then I'm hoping that we'll also be speaking at DEF CON. We've applied to speak at DEF CON. We haven't heard back. Um, we've spoken at DEF CON a number of times before. And we have one project on top of the rest that's a bigger deal than the others. And we're hoping that we can drop that big bomb at, uh, at DEF CON. And um, wow. there'll be some really interesting tools that will be available to the public starting this summer. And um, yeah, uh, stay tuned. It's going to be good. Yeah, definitely. Definitely want to hear about this. Well, M well Michael, you know, yeah. I, I got to say, I, I applaud your mission and, uh, and the group. You get, you're one of those rare people that are making a difference in this world, make it a better place. Yeah. Um, I think, I think uh, it's needed. We're more doing our best. Than, than and ever. the one thing that I have to emphasize is that, you know, although I do my bit, 
it is a collective a lot yeah. of because all of these people are staying in the shadows to protect themselves because they have regular lives it's important that everybody know that it's not just me like i i basically have am in the wonderful position of being able to brag about the brilliant hard work by a huge number of brilliant hardworking people who believe in this mission and have have come together to create these tools that make it possible for people to improve their health without having to interface with institutions or ask anybody's permission mm. or needing to raise a bunch of money. And um, they are really the ones that do the wonderful work that I'm so proud of. Um, yeah. And, I'm, my hat and I get to talk them. about it. But, <laughs> yeah, yes. but they're, yeah. they're, they are amazing. And um, to any of them listening right now, I love you all. And thank you so much for everything you do. <laughs> Yeah, Michael, thank you to all. Of yeah, th thank you. I mean, my hat's off to you all. Uh, Michael, thanks for being on the show. And people, you can learn more about the uh, Four Thieves Vinegar Collective at their site, fourthievesvinegar.org. And uh, Michael, do you have anything else you'd, you you want to plug? If you like what Four Thieves does and you believe in the mission and you'd like to support it, find somebody who needs your help and help them whether you think they deserve it or not. <laughs> on that note, thanks for being on the show, man. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.